I do have a, a, a new book that just came out. It's called Surviving Feelings. Uh, if you deal with any kind of dark emotions, it's a devotional that'll help you walk through those feelings. Uh, that's for 20. All four books, if you want to grab all four, I give one free. So it's 60 for all four. I take Cash App, PayPal, Venmo. You can see me after. Uh, more importantly, right now, I am conducting a 100-hour case study on David Berkowitz. In fact, if you can show that slide, also known as the son of Sam. Uh, he killed six people, shot 15 back in the 19. 19- 70s, he's incarcerated for the rest of his life in Shogun Correctional Facility. He'd be 70 years old in about three weeks. And in 1988, the son of Sam became a son of God. And if you don't believe the gospel is potent enough to save a serial killer, then you haven't read it. Because the gospel is powerful enough to transform the worst of the worst. In fact, this morning I read from you from David's Bible. He gave me this as a gift at my last visit. Um, I've sat with him for 97 hours. Actually, I just sat with him, fulfilled 100 hours. Uh, but, you know, we, the friendship will continue for all of our time here on earth. Uh, David's story will be featured in book format in the fall. Uh, Michael Francais, former gangster from the New York City, is writing the foreword. Tiff Shuttlesworth, an evangelist that's internationally known, is writing the epilogue. Uh, Michael and I are going into the prison with Don Wilkerson in September to interview David Berkowitz. It'll be featured on YouTube. So please keep this in prayer. I believe this is a project that's needed in a culture where there are 13 mass shootings a week in the United States of America. There's about two per year in countries in the Near East. 13 a week in America. Something sick and wrong with our culture. In fact, if you're here and you want updates, you don't follow me yet on Facebook, uh, just raise your hand. I'm going to have an usher give you a card. It has a QR code. Uh, The usher will give you the card, QR code. Just go on, on, uh, just take a picture of that QR code, go on the Facebook page and follow and you'll be updated, okay? I do have a word for you this morning. I'm so excited. If you can open your Bible to Mark chapter 5. I want to preach to you out of a passage that is very dear to David Berkowitz. Uh, This is a passage that shortly after his salvation, 35 years ago, he read this passage and this passage read him. That's the power of the Word of God as we look into it and it looks into us. It is the greatest psychology book ever written. It is a mirror of the soul. It confronts the sinner in you. It unleashes the winner in you. The image of Adam, the image of God. So I want to look at this passage this morning, and I want to talk to you specifically about risk factors. Risk factors. I I believe that there are people in this sanctuary this morning that are at risk. At risk for relapse, at risk for backsliding, at risk for self-destruction, suicide, homicide. I pray this morning, you being in the house of God, you being with the people of God, that you would find safety and shelter. We're rescuing this morning those that are at risk. Father, we just pray a blessing on this word. We look into it. Let it look into us. We thank you for David's salvation. And Lord, if you saved and forgave the son of Sam, then you can save and forgive anyone this morning. I pray for those that are under demonic oppression. I pray today the chains would break. Let the chains break. In Jesus' name, amen. Mark chapter 4, risk factors. Mark 4. Real quick, before I read the passage, this guy goes to the doctor. He says, Doc, he says, my shoulder's hurting. He goes, I heard it in two places. Can you help me? Doctor says, I can help you. He says, how are you going to help me? He says, real simple. Don't go back to those two places. (laughs) That's what you get when you go to an Italian doctor. (laughs) Right to the point. Mark 5, it says that 
in Mark chapter 5, Jesus gets out of the ship, and immediately he meets, going to verse 2, immediately he meets a man in the tombs with an unclean spirit. The man had been dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains. Somebody say chains. chains. Your pastor just talked talk to you about chains. It says he'd been dwelling there. And because he'd been often bound with fetters and chains, the chains had been plucked asunder, broke in pieces, and nothing and no one could tame him. Day and night, he in the mountains, in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. I pray for every person under a masochistic spirit this morning that you be set free from that self-hatred. The Bible says in verse 6, he saw Jesus and he ran and he worshipped him. He said, what do you have to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure thee that thou not torment me. Somebody say, don't get it twisted. God is for you, not against you. Jesus said to him, come out of this man, you unclean spirit. He asked him, what is your name? And he answered, my name is Legion, for we are many. He besought him much that he would not send him out of the territory. There was nearby a great herd of swine feeding. All the devils said to him, send us into the swine. So the demon came out of the man and went into the swine. And the Bible says, the swine drowned in the sea. And then it says the people came out. Listen to this. They see the man. He's dressed in his right mind. They see the pigs. The pigs have drowned in the sea. And the Bible says the people beg Jesus to leave the region. Think of that. Let's talk about this. I want to talk to you about risk factors. A, a risk factor is any condition that increases the susceptibility towards injury. Now, when we look at mass shooters, oftentimes, I'm a PhD in behavioral science, we ask the question, what were the risk factors? Why this one man? Why this young man? Why, in this passage, we can ask, why this one man in this city? Why is he possessed? Why my son? Why my daughter? We tend to think it's other people, but I got news for you. There's no such thing as other people. What can happen to one can happen to anyone, given certain risk factors. Now, in this passage, I want to talk to you about three particular risk factors, three circumstances that put this man susceptible, increase his vulnerability for demonic oppression. I want to talk to you about his tribe. I want to talk to you about his trauma. And I want to talk to you about a truce. Let's talk about his tribe. The Bible says that he was from an area known as the Gadarenes. Now, what we know about the Gadarenes, it was one city in ten cities. The ten cities were known as the Decapolis. Decapolis in Greek means ten cities. In this area, the Torah was not taught. The truth was not told. This was a very dark territory. Somebody said dark tribe. Some of us came from some dark tribes. Some of us grew up in homes where the gospel was not taught, the truth was not told, and in that darkness, the enemy, he looks for the vulnerable, he prays on the weak, and he's looking for the one that comes from a certain kind of tribe. Now this man, he's from the Gadarenes. In the Gadarenes, the truth is not told. The Torah is not taught. They do not have the power to save this man. They can't save him. The very best they can do is subdue him. The Bible says they put chains on him. They don't have the power to restore him. The very best they can do is restrain him. 
When you come from a family, they don't know the gospel, they don't know Christ. It's a family of darkness, maybe generations deep. That family, they didn't have the power to restore you, and maybe the very best they could do was restrain you. Now this man, he caused lots of commotion. He caused lots of confusion. The Bible says he was self-destructive. And maybe you, in your family, you were a lot of trouble. You caused commotion. Maybe they didn't put metallic chains on you. But in our day and age, we put chemical chains on people. We put them on medication. So we're still putting shackles on people. When people don't behave, when they don't play the part, when they don't act accordingly, we send them to institutions, we put them on psychotropics, we send them to the psychiatrist. When we don't have the power to restore people, then the second best thing we can do is restrain people. David Berkowitz was growing up in the Bronx in the Soundview section where the man who raised me grew up in the same neighborhood in the Bronx. He was such commotion in his classroom. In the third grade, his teacher would have to pin him down against the floor. His father would have to tackle him because he would punch himself in the head at five years old, seven years old. They would send him to the therapist every Saturday morning. His mother would drive him to Manhattan where he would meet with Miss Sosnoff and sit for two hours, but there was nothing strong enough to subdue him. And I believe that there's a commotion in our culture right now that medication is no longer strong enough to restrain the evil that is at loose in our society. Now, I'm not against medicine. I'm a PhD in behavioral science. I could teach you a lecture on neurotransmitters and how psychotropics will sometimes subdue certain neuro- neurotransmitters. It'll boost other neurotransmitters. But medication, it may subdue you, but only Jesus can save you. When medical examiners conducted the autopsy on the two Columbine shooters, Eric Harris and Dylan Claybold, they found four psychotropics that were prescribed to the shooters, four medications that they took every day. But just like this passage, there was nothing strong enough to subdue the evil that was inside of him. Utilize your medicine. Don't idolize it. Only Jesus can save and restore the soul. But we got a culture that thinks it's all psychological. I got news for you. David's story, yes, it is psychological. And yes, I do examine all the mental health factors. But John 10.10 says it best. The thief has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come to bring life. It is psychological, but it is also diabolical. Andrew Del Banco, he's a secularist. He's not even a believer. He's a professor at NYU. Excuse me. Professor at Columbia University. Not even a believer. He writes a book called The Death of Satan, challenging cultures that remove the idea of Satan from its framework. And he begins the book with this phrase. This is from a secularist. He says, a gulf has opened in our culture between the visibility of evil and the intellectual resources to cope with it. He's saying all of our theories have failed us. We once thought evil was a result of a lack of social support. But then Marxism showed us if you take the means of production and you put it in the hands of the oppressed, the oppressed become the oppressors. He said, we thought it was a lack of knowledge, that if people knew better, they would do better. But then the Holocaust taught us that there was mad geniuses that had built the concentration camps. Education without a heart change 
only makes you a more clever devil. He said, now we say it's mental illness, it's psychological, yet we've got more psychotropics in America than any place on the earth. Everyone has a therapist. Everyone is going to the psychiatrist. And we have the highest ranking of mass shootings, serial killings, child pornography, human trafficking than any nation in the world. That's coming from a secularist. I want to meet Mr. Del Banco and say you are not far from the kingdom of heaven. So the tribe, the tribe in which you grow up in, that tribe, if you, if you walk with the wise, you will be wise. But if you grow up among fools, you grow up among dysfunctional people, then you become dysfunctional. I prophesy over you, you may not have come out of a good family, but a good family is coming out of you. Amen. <laughs> Let's, let's keep talking about this tribe. The Bible says they see the deliverance. They see the man dressed in his right mind, but then they see the pigs. The pigs is their industry. The pigs is the, are their profit. The pigs are how they make their money. They see the pigs have drowned in the sea, and they beg Jesus to leave the region. I'm talking about a tribe where the pigs were more important than a soul. And some of us grew up in tribes where the pigs were more important than our soul. The family you grew up in, their name, their reputation, their careers, it was more important than your well-being, and it put you at risk. Listen, if you, the beauty of Christianity is if the first birth messed you up, you can be born all over again. <laughs> And if the first family jacked you up, welcome to the family of God. Yeah. You're here. You're part of a church where people are the priority. That's why this church is growing and moving and advancing is because he who wins souls is wise. And in this church, the soul is more important than the pigs. The soul is more important than the carpet, than the programs. In this church, we don't restrain, we restore. Dr. James Allen in 1971, he stood up in Austin, Texas in front of his church and he said, Congregation, I'm so sad that we missed our opportunity to change the world. He said, we were too busy with our programs, we we're too busy with carnality, too busy with temporal things. We missed our chance. A little boy, he sat in the front row, he was here every Sunday, hardly any of us even paid attention. That little boy grew up, his name was Sirhan Sirhan, and he put a bullet in Robert Kennedy. He said, the pigs were more important than the soul." My prayer this morning is that in this church, people are the priority. The second risk factor in this passage is not just the tribe, but I want to talk to you about this man's trauma. Now, Jesus asks the man the demon's name, and the demon says, Legion. Legion is a Roman platoon of 10,000 soldiers. In fact, Bible commentator William Barclay tells us that this particular area, the Gadarenes, it was just decimated by Roman legions. This man is a remnant survivor of Roman decimation. When the Romans would come into an area, they would come and they would destroy the community. Chances are they massacred this man's family. So when he says legion, it is not just a description of the powers of darkness, which it is that too, but it is alluding to his trauma. He has seen things and he has heard things that nobody should ever see that nobody should ever hear, that kind of trauma is a doorway for terror. 
I've dealt with three serial killers. The first two, purely psychopathic. It was just games. We didn't get very far. The third, David Berkowitz, genuine conversion. I don't know one person that was demonized that as a kid wasn't traumatized. Satan's favorite Bible verse manipulates it for his own agenda. Raise a child up in the way that they should go and when they are older, they won't depart from it. Jesus knew the severity of wounding a child, of abusing a child, of sexually exploiting little ones when he said, woe unto you if you hurt, the word hurt in Greek is scandalized, traumatized. If you traumatize one of these little ones, better a millstone around your neck. If you're here and you're doing something twisted to a child with those hands, I warn you, it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Legion is a description, not just of the powers of darkness, but it's this man's experience, his trauma. Trauma is the perfect setup. Trauma will lead you to a place of unbelief. God, where were you? It leads you to unforgiveness. It'll lead you to resentment. This man has been traumatized, and trauma hasn't just disturbed him, it's defined him. He says, my name is Legion. It's become his name. For some people, their trauma's become their name. It's one thing to say, I was unloved. It's another thing to say, I am unlovable. It's one thing to say, I was victimized. It's another thing to say, I am a victim. The trauma has become his identity. It's become who he is. We don't even know his birth name. There's no mention of the name on his birth certificate. But guess what? God knows your name, and your name is written in the book of life. God knows you better than anybody knows you. He knew you in your mother's womb. What's the significance of that? He knew you before your uncle touched you. He knew you before the world conditions you. He knows the real you. And if I want to find me, I look for him because he's got the key to me. Some of us, sickness has become our name. For some of us, depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, psychosis, post-trauma, all of these things have become our name. The trauma, it doesn't just disturb him, but it defines him. It's a great risk factor when sickness becomes your name. We see this in John 5. Jesus heals a paralyzed man, tells him, pick up your mat and walk. A few verses later in John 5, I believe it's verse 14, the Bible says Jesus finds the man sinning in the temple. What could he possibly be doing wrong in the temple? Well, in the temple, on the outside, in the courtyard, beggars on their mats would beg. The man's gone back to the mat. Go back to the mat. It's become his identity. It's become his livelihood. It's sometimes it's hard to get rid of the sickness because the sickness has become your livelihood. Without the sickness, no more social security check. Without the sickness, you got to get a job. Without the sickness, you got to take responsibility for your life. So sometimes the sickness becomes the identity. Finds him sitting in the temple. He's going back to the mat. Jesus said to him, see, I made you well. My name is Legion. Now I want to bring you to the third risk factor, and that's the truce this man enters into. The Bible says that he's cutting himself. He's got these stones. David Berkowitz, from the time he was six years old, he would punch himself as hard as he possibly could in the head. He said, Mike, there was a power. He said, I'm telling you, from the time I was young, it was satanic influence. He said, when we would go on a subway, I'd have to stand against the back wall in the subway station because the urges were so strong to throw myself in front of the subway train. 
Now, this may seem strange. This story may look deranged, but I got news for you. All sinful practices are masochistic. If I had time, I could show you how, how pornography mutilates the psyche, how jealousy is destroying your relationships, how greed is devouring your passion, how lust is taking away your strength. All sinful practices are a masochism of the temple of God. So we read this passage and we go, how strange, how deranged. He's cutting himself with stones. What's your stone? Are you cutting yourself with words? Are you cutting yourself with toxic relationships? Are you cutting yourself with substance, with alcohol, with all of these kinds of things that you're entering into a truce with the one who wants to destroy you? Satan has an agenda to destroy you. Self-harm beats him to it. The word renounce means to break the truce. It means I'm no longer agreeing with you. Eve talking to the serpent. She's looking for agreement. Satan wants you to agree with him. He wants you to participate in his plan to destroy you. He's looking for you to be complicit in your own destruction. I, I believe there's a masochistic spirit in our culture right now. I don't care how many images you see on Facebook of people smiling and people looking happy and loving themselves underneath all that facade, that sheen of legitimacy, underneath, underneath all of it is a self-hatred. People got more filters than Keurig on Facebook. You want to know why social media is making some of us depressed? The, the, the studies are showing more social media usage, more depression. Because you're comparing yourself, your real self, the self you see in the morning, bags under your eyes, the real self, your real self. You're comparing your real self with other people's ideal self. It's going to bring some depression. You're internalizing false standards. You enter into a truce of destroying yourself. I want to flip the script on you. This risk factor, this man's at risk because of his tribe, because of his trauma, because of the truce he's entered into with the enemy. I got news for you. Your risk factor, that weakness, that vulnerability in your life, that circumstance that made you an outcast, do you know that that risk factor, that thing that puts you at risk is the same exact thing that puts you on God's list? Satan preys on the weak. God chooses the weak. 1 Corinthians 1.26. Satan's like a lion. If you watch the Animal Channel, David Berkowitz said to me, he said, Mike, I got a TV in my cell, 46 channels. I watch the Animal Channel. The lion will look for the one gazelle, the one animal that's injured. He'll look for the hurt one. He says Satan preys on the weak. But guess what? Satan preys on the weak. And God chooses the weak. Satan chases whom God chooses. I don't think he's attacking you because you're so pathetic. He's attacking you because you're so prophetic. He sees the promise. He sees the call. Like Pharaoh, he says, we got to stop this people now. They're growing too big. There's potential. Satan knows that the outcasts are the best candidates for the kingdom of God. That when the God shows up, he doesn't look for the 16 brothers in Jesse's house. He wants the one outcast that's in the middle of the field. So I got news for you. If you've been at risk your whole life, you're on God's list. I got news for you. If you got weakness and you got vulnerability in your life, that weakness and vulnerability is what qualifies you. It is the very factor that God says, if I can get a hold of this weakness, the same pain that Satan meant to destroy you, that pain God will use to develop you. Stand up with me. Worship team, hallelujah. Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. I, I believe there are people here, you're at risk. Maybe since you're a kid, you've been at risk. I know, one, I know from the stats, one in three ladies in this room have been sexually abused by the age of 18. One, two, you, 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 one in five boys. That kind of damage, oh, Satan's all over it, but he also knows that when God gets his hand on that vulnerability, on that weakness, let me tell you, the anointing oil is comprised partly of myrrh. Myrrh is bitter. It's bitterness. Bitter seasons. God will take affliction and make anointing out of the afflictions. I, I believe there's a certain anointing on my life and I can trace it back to the afflictions. I can trace it back to the vulnerabilities, the risk factors, the weaknesses. Growing up with a dad in prison, visiting dad, mom on welfare, in a bad neighborhood. All these factors I can look at and I can say, God, from the days of my youth, You've been grooming me. It's all how you see it and say it. You know what's doing the most damage to you? It's not your experiences. It's your explanations of your experiences. How do you explain it? Which way are you going to go in this pain? When you're in pain, what are you going to do with it? You're going to go one way or the other. Now, if you know you're vulnerable and you've been vulnerable, you feel at risk in some way, or... Someone very close to you is at risk, and you're praying for them. Either way, I want you to come to this altar. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray alongside you. I'm going to agree with you. We're going to break every truce. We're going to prophesy life over you, your family. You may come out of a bad family, but a good family is coming out of you. Hey, Pastor Dave here. Just want to say thank you so much for tuning in to our YouTube channel. Uh, make sure if you want to stay up to speed with all the videos that we're going to post in the future, you subscribe to our channel and uh, share it. Get the word out to everybody. Lastly, make sure you go to our website. We have our DNA there, everything the church uh, is about here at Glad Tidings Community Church and all the different ministries that we offer. You can go to www.gtcc.church. Again, thanks for tuning in. God bless you.